This past month, some colleagues and I played a very spooky game of video essay telephone, each challenging each other to make a short video on a classic or not so classic piece of horror media. Kiki from Kiki Crazed had me watch the movie The Addiction, a brooding black and white vampire flick and Sopranos pre-union that came out in 1995. The Addiction follows philosophy grad student Kathleen through her transformation into a vampire in New York City and her violent addiction to human blood, which comes to a fever pitch at a snuff orgy and only concludes in the movie's end when Kathleen's vampire self dies and she's newly reborn as a Christian human. And I know just what you're thinking now. 1995 Five? That's a full decade before Stephanie Meyer published the groundbreaking young adult novel Twilight, which centers a different angsty vampire, Edward Cullen. When did vampires get so angsty and so Christian? I mean, Edward never exactly proselytizes to Bella about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but he's so darn abstinent both from sex before marriage and from that other big lust, human blood. Edward believes that his soul is damned for these desires, and even though his status as an immortal vampire precludes him from eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, he still feels that he must suffer to save his soul and Bella's. But were vampires always this religious? Because in The Addiction, Kathleen meets another vampire who, like Edward Cullen, has been struggling for centuries against his bassist urge to sin in order to live more like a human. Vampires often stand for this primitive, pre-human thirst, a thirst that can only truly be quenched by giving yourself over to a higher power, but vampires aren't as old and primitive as you might think. Although there may be folklores from many cultures involving undead people or creatures feasting on human blood, those figures don't necessarily have enough in common for us to really say anything interesting about them as a collective. Vampires as we know them are a European invention that didn't really begin to take shape until the early 18th century, so vampires are not in fact this ancient problem that Christianity solves, but rather they represent a modern crisis in Christianity itself. The first recorded vampires were the reanimated corpses of Orthodox Serbian civilians perceived by their fellow peasants to be traitors, that is, sympathizers in life with the Protestant Austrians or Muslim Ottomans that alternately governed them. And Try to imagine being a Christian in 1725. The Christian world is fractured into Eastern Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Protestantism, and people are getting killed over it. Is God with you? Everything is changing. Once segregated cultures are colliding head to head and you're being confronted with more information in a day than your ancestors learned in a lifetime, the smallest details of your everyday life are subjected to minute shifting political forces far beyond your understanding or control. Your destiny, God's plan for you, is now suddenly obfuscated by a shroud of ambiguity. Jesus rose from the dead to spare your soul and now your sussy neighbor is rising from the dead to take it away again. Of course you're going to drive a stake through his corpse's heart. You've got to take the power back somehow. And a good quarter of a millennium later, Kathleen finds herself confronted with similar images of religious conflict. Though she lives in relatively safe mundanity from the ivory tower of academia, violence bleeds into her world before she gets turned into a vampire. She becomes deeply anxious after viewing images of the Bosnian Genocide and the Holocaust. Visually, the addiction takes cues from German Expressionism, a product of the precarious Weimar Republic that preceded the Holocaust. Expressionism is characterized by dramatic light and shadow cast over exaggerated and abstracted sets. In 1922, the Expressionist tradition brought us one of the most recognizable images of the classical vampire, Count Orlok in F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu, second only to Bela Lugosi's depiction of Dracula in 1931. These visual nods to early cinema lend a maturity to the addiction's vampires, and in turn, Nosferatu characterizes Count Orlok as a figure at home in the old world of Eastern Europe, but already starkly out of place in industrializing Germany and bringing with him a plague that harkens back to the medieval period. And this is the danger of the vampire, not their propensity for ancient ancient human vices, but their very modern boundary crossings. Their existence consists in traversing borders between cultures, nations, eras, social classes, religious sects, and at their core, between the states of living and death. But it was only the new social order and hypermobility of modernism that enabled these boundaries to be crossed in the first place. 
But if these things are all mutable, then what are we? Are our most rigid identities just drawn in the sand? These are the questions that vampires ask, and it seems that the answer offered by the Christian vampire is simply, stop crossing those lines. If you are a vampire, you must struggle to be as human as possible, but is it really possible to uncross the line from vampirism back into humanity as Kathleen does, or must Christianity now confront vampirism head on? and use it to reassert a heteronormative nuclear family structure like Bella Swan does in Breaking Dawn. So I hope you enjoyed all that, and now it's my turn to go give Hizzy Hay a very spooky telephone call, so I hope you'll go check out his video about the classic BBC Scarefest and one of the very best found footage flicks, Ghost Watch. Now, let's just, uh... Oh, that's weird. It sounds like the line is busy. Hmm. You should go and figure out what that's all about.